I would consider myself someone who's greatly impacted by the media I consume. In other words, I like cool shit. Be it a movie, manga, anime, or game, I tend to remember media that have memorable music, characters, settings, or stories. For example, a boss fight can stick out to me if the accompanying set piece and music gel together nicely. 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim was a game I finished a long while ago, even longer ago than I teased it on the channel. I thought I was gonna get to this a lot sooner, but then I got cripplingly addicted to Genshin Impact. Scum. It was a game I kinda just picked out on a whim, and it seemed even more interesting than the trailers let on. And once I picked it up, I was immediately under its spell. Since then, I vividly remember the vice grip that the game had on me during its entire runtime. It's an experience I still have trouble forgetting, and I can confidently say that this is one of the greatest visual novels I've ever had the joy of experiencing. Today, I'd like to give my thoughts on this RTS visual novel, but also an elevator pitch to newer players. I recommend playing this game completely blind, but for those who'd like to learn more about the game and its systems, this video is for you. This mini-review and primer will be completely spoiler-free, and only feature footage from each character's prologue, a couple of adventure segments, and battle sections. Additionally, this review will feature coverage from the base PS4 version. I will be talking about the Switch port very briefly, but both versions are largely the same. Now. Let's activate our Sentinel and defend the Earth from certain destruction. The year is 1985. Life continues as normal in the sleepy Ashitaba city. Many of its residents go through the day-to-day -day motions, like the students of Sakura High. All that matters right now is small time. Crepes, cute boys, sports, and that hot new Miyuki Inaba record. And you know I'm streaming Seaside Vacation, BABY! These are the days that they'll treasure the most, until... the end of the world begins. Just as you said, a kaiju attacked, like in that movie. So we'll do what we have to do. Get in the robots and fight. Our fate was sealed a long time ago. That fateful day, alien kaiju from space descend on Earth. They don't appear to be friendly either. In fact, it's the aliens who are clapping cheeks this time. It's up to 13 high schoolers to hop in the cockpits of these massive mechas and do what they can to protect all they hold dear. And to do that, they need to execute Operation Aegis, humanity's last-ditch effort to shut down the invading kaiju. Except, is any of this real? Or is it a dream? That's what the protagonists of this game are wondering too. The player is tasked with uncovering the truth of all of these events, as this game weaves this gigantic narrative tapestry. I'm not gonna mince words here. The writing in this game is top-notch. The characters are really fun and interesting, and I especially like the chemistry that all of them share. Part of the reason I kept going is to see this chemistry, and more of my favorite characters, like the rough and tough Yuki Takamiya. She was the character I was the most interested in before I bought the game, and I was really excited to unlock her story. She is a punch girl, Sukeban, with a red and black color scheme. This whole was made for me! A lot of these character types, too, have influenced my character mascots for the channel, too. So you can tell right from just looking at Yuki that yes, this is this one's for me. The main reason I kept going though is that once 13 Sentinel starts firing on all cylinders, it's very difficult to put down. This happens right away and it carries this momentum through its prologue section. The drip read approach to the narrative means that you'll slowly be learning new things about its setting and characters, but that doesn't make it any less interesting. For me, this meant that most nightly sessions would go on for a lot longer than I initially thought just because I wanted to see what happened next. I'd come home from work, sit down and think I'd be playing for an hour or two before bed, and then I'd look at the clock one minute, and then the next it would already be past two in the morning. <laughs> then throughout the following day, when I was at work, the only thing I could think about was what I saw the night prior and what all of it meant. I was kind of just piecing together all of these things in my brain. <laughs> 
In fact, while recording the footage for this video, the game got me AGAIN! I was sitting down reading all the text like, damn this game is so interesting, as if I've never seen any of it before. So I will say that the game presents a lot of information to you in this remembrance section, and as a result, it might seem a little overwhelming to experience this giant story through 13 different eyes. But Sentinels does a great job on focusing on what you're currently seeing, all while keeping the big picture in the back of your mind. These stories all converge and weave together, so the fact that it manages to juggle all this at the same time is seriously impressive. I do recommend playing this game in concentrated efforts, as again, there's a lot to remember, but if for any reason you decide to drop it and pick it back up again, there's an in-game lore bible that's constantly being updated with information the more you play. This means that you can not only replay events if you want to, but you can also catch the Cliff Notes version of everything you've experienced so far. I think my favorite thing about this game, though, is just how much it draws from the pop culture it's influenced by in order to set up its story beats. If 13 Sentinels reminds you of sci-fi classics like Ava, Gundam, or even Macross, that's the point. It even takes inspiration from 80s American flicks like E.T. and War of the Worlds. Well, I don't go around granting wishes for free. In exchange, I need you to do something for me. After you agree to a binding contract, that is. Holy shit! Is that a Madoka reference?! All of these things together form a delicious yakisoba pan of a narrative, one that's too difficult to not eat in one bite. The Remembrance Story sections will have you taking control of one character at a time in order to uncover what's really going on in the story. In these bits, you navigate small environments and speak to other NPCs in order to advance. There is light puzzle solving required, but it's mostly through the game's use of the Thought Cloud mechanic. And this mechanic serves as an inventory, with topics of interest working as keys to unlock new story beats. You can also use your thought cloud to gain insight on what your character thinks about these topics, so give it a try if you just want to hear what they think. In this section, you take control of Juro Karabe, one of the game's 13 protagonists. Your buddy wants to catch up with Amiguchi to hang out after school. Thing is, neither of you know where he actually is. He might be in the cafeteria, but that's not a surefire thing. Heading there means you'll come up short, but you'll still get some important insight on what's going on with Jero's home life. Retrying this section and getting more information first might be more fruitful. In fact, this may not be the only way this scenario can go. It's up to you to make that call. This non-linear, choose-your-own-adventure approach to the gameplay is how you'll be seeing more of the game's story. With that being said though, I really recommend playing this game without a guide. It's difficult to miss things, and there's no way to lock yourself out of story events. It's also very easy to spoil yourself with a single Google search. Trying out new things and seeing what'll happen is the fun of this section, and you are actively encouraged to go back and make new decisions. The game does lightly railroad the player, which at first seemingly goes against the choose-your-own-adventure approach to its narrative, but it's for a very important reason. All of this means is that progression in one character's story can be halted by progression in another, meaning that some events aren't available until you do something else, and the game will tell you exactly what that is. On some occasions too, the combat sections will also prevent you from going forward in the story. Again, the game will tell you what you need to do. So the reason why the game locks these things over is because you need proper context from other events in order to experience the others, you know, some things will just naturally spoil others. And barring these restrictions, the game's story is largely approachable from, like, any order. <laughs> Which is, I think, what makes it so interesting. 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim is beautiful in all areas, but the Remembrance section is where it is the most dazzling. As is the Vanillaware Norm, everything is hand-drawn. This means that extra care was placed into every single facet of this game. The character sprites were all passionately and meticulously crafted, with all of these little touches in these sprites, such as how they stand or how they run, and they're different for pretty much every character. I also feel like these environments have an extreme level of care put into them, despite how little you spend in some of these. Many of these places are these large 2.5D dioramas, which each depict their own vibe. We can see this right away, and I especially love the classroom setting, so let me paint you a picture. Another long school day is over, and the students are all chatting in the classroom. Everyone's talking about what they want to do, whether it's getting ice cream or staying behind for clubs. The warm sunlight peeks through the windows and illuminates the classroom, almost interested in what everyone's talking about. And the slowly setting sun kisses the curtains, the walls, and the desktops in such an organic way that it's breathtaking. Which is impressive because the lighting might... Cat? <laughs> 
which is impressive because the lighting is maybe the only inorganic thing here. This moment perfectly captures the after-school feeling the game is trying to present, and it's not the only area like this. I also wanted to take a minute to talk about the quality of the localization, specifically the English dub. With the amount of text in this game's script and the complexity of its narrative, it's a serious triumph that it came out as well as it did. There are a lot of moving parts, so a behemoth like 13 Sentinels must have been a giant undertaking to localize. Even more so, since almost all of this dialogue is fully voiced, which at the time it was being recorded, was next to impossible. That's right, almost all of the English voice dialogue in this game was done during the 2020 pandemic meaning that most of the dub actors had to create makeshift at-home studios if they didn't already have one. The result of all of these efforts is a stellar dub, one that I highly recommend checking out. Seriously, the amount of work that they put in really, really shines through. So why are you dressed like that now? Because I know you like it. Uh oh. It's a dub that's emblematic of this game's main themes, which is to struggle against all odds for a greater goal. All of these little details heighten its already immersive atmosphere in the Remembrance part, and complement the game's equally lengthy other half, the Destruction portion. And I wanted to talk about this portion at length. This is because I personally feel like this is the hardest sell to newer players. I don't really know people who have played real-time strategy games, and to be honest, I don't either. Aegis Rim was the first time I played an RTS, and it made me feel right at home with its systems, thankfully. I wanted to walk you, dear viewer, through these systems to show you that it's not as daunting as it looks. And to do this, we'll look at each phase of battle separately. Before you start a battle, you have to organize your strike team. There's a lot of information to parse through on this preparation phase, so let's take it in chunks. Six pilots can only be deployed at a time. Each sentinel type comes with its own strength and weaknesses. The type or generation of sentinel that a character pilots is shown under their portraits. And before you can field them, you have to understand what each of them can do. Gen 1 sentinels are bruiser types that specialize in close range combat. They've remembered the basics of CQC. Hijiyama, Ogata, and Sekigahara pilot these. What they lack in ranged options and mobility, they can make up for with their devastating power. They can also slice through armored kaiju like butter, too. Gen 1s require a good amount of external support, but they definitely shine under the right circumstances. Gen 2 sentinels are all-rounder types, meaning that they are the most balanced across all sentinel types. Karabe, Fuyusaka, and Shinonome have you covered if you need a generalist because they can learn skills that can really get you out of a jam in most situations. The sentry gun is my favorite, because it's a remote little turret that can snipe kaiju from afar. It's also a little overpowered. Gen 3 sentinels are stationary mecha that excel in long-ranged combat. You want to park Minami, Miura, and Kisaragi near the terminals because they can comfortably take pot shots from there without really worrying about taking any damage. But they're very weak at close quarters. As long as they're properly supported, they're a very, very vital asset to any team. Speaking of support, Gen 4 Sentinels are flight-based support units. Yakushiji, Takamiya, Goto, and Amiguchi are the linchpin to any successful team composition. They have unmatched movement and can support teammates with things such as sentries or shields. Are you paying attention? Are you taking notes? Going back to the team organization screen, you may notice the customization option. You can use this tab to unlock and upgrade character loadouts called armaments using a currency that we can refer to as meta chips. Meta chips are gained through fighting and you get more than enough to suit all of your needs. You want to check back here to frequently kit your characters out, be it to unlock or enhance armaments. Now, one of the most important parts of the customization tab, and please Please don't neglect this, is the meta system section. What this tab does is it increases the amount of things you can do with your terminal on the field, and once we get to the battle section, you'll see that this is the area that you're guarding. You may be defending it, but it has other uses other than just being a tower to defend. You can't unlock new armaments for your characters without leveling up this terminal, so you want to do that first and foremost. You can pick up new meta skills here, which are terminal skills that can instantly change the tide of battle. This can range from an EMP, or raising health, or EP, or, my favorite, being able to instantly act again with all of your characters after their turns have passed. That's pretty strong! I personally recommend leveling up your terminal a bit first, then increasing meta skill uses, and then lastly, picking up any skills you think you might need. 
Pay attention, y'all. This is on the final. All these things in mind, you want to take a peek at both the Kaiju trend and the bonus objectives at the bottom of the screen. The Kaiju trend will tell you what types will appear in that mission, and some of these variants are heavily armored, can fly, and so on. You're not expected to know what these all are from the get-go, so take your time understanding and getting a feel for your enemies. Lastly, the bonus objectives. These are these special conditions that give you, well, bonuses, mainly mystery files for your in-game lore bible. These aren't too tough to fulfill, so if you want the 100% completion, I would urge anyone to try and unlock them. With all these things in mind, you can build a team comp depending on what the situation calls for. The key to victory is a well-rounded composition that complements and supports one another. Yeah, maybe this shit'll make sense once I actually get to punch something. I know what you're thinking, this looks like a lot. And you're right, but I'm gonna try my best to break it all down for you in an easily digestible format. During these top-down battle segments, the main goal is to defend the terminal which all of your characters are arranged near. To do this, you either hold out for the timer on top, or you wipe out all of the kaiju that are advancing toward your direction. More often than not though, you'll be doing the latter. Now, every character has the same four options available. Action brings up the armaments that a character has equipped, showing the range, the function, and the EP cost. And EP is basically your MP in a traditional RPG. To move is to reposition your sentinel to another point on the map, and you can freely pick where they go. But be careful, most sentinels barring Gen 4 sentinels can only move along the blue grid shown on the map. Gen 4 sentinels can fly anywhere. The repair option is something that I'd only really save for a tight situation. It lets you recover the sentinel's HP at the cost of ejecting the pilot. I don't really recommend this, because once the pilot's ejected, they're still on the field. They're just in their squishy little poo babby human form, and anything will kill them. So if you really want to go ahead and repair your Sentinel, you have to be prepared to protect the pilot. And if you lose a pilot, you fail the mission. That's the only other way you can fail a mission, with the other being to let the terminal fall. Lastly, defend charges your EP. I like to think of this as double park mode. You kind of just park your sentinel in the middle of the battlefield, unmoving as they charge their EP. And once you pick an option, a character will execute this action and then take up their turn. From there, you can pick the next pilot to act. The terminal health, pilot health, who can act, and so on are visible from the top left of the screen. The top right displays the map, which has key info on it too. A lot of this may seem overwhelming, but as long as you take quick glances from top left, top right, so on, you should be okay. If you've played a game like Fire Emblem, then this is thankfully not too alien to you. The difference here is that the game moves in real time, and if you really need to stop and think about your next move, you can hover over a pilot and kind of collect your thoughts, so to speak. The flow of combat is constantly changing, so the game requires you to adapt on the fly. And you'll know you're kicking ass when the music shifts into another phase, which is my favorite touch about the combat. I also really like the quotes when you mouse over a character or when you use their skills. Really does remind me of Fire Emblem. Now, once you win, you'll go to the results screen. This is where characters are awarded XP and are ranked based on your performance on the field. The last part I want to go over in this destruction phase is the win streak and brain overload. After a wave, the characters who participated in that fight will have a little meter above their head. This meter indicates their brain overload, or BOL for short. If you feel the character twice in a row, they're unable to fight in the wave after. So if you put them on the field twice, you're basically frying their brains. This is where your win streak comes in, however. The more battles you win in a row, the more rewards you get. However, this comes at the cost of potentially microwaving a pilot's brain, which goes without saying, you kind of want to avoid. To maximize your score, you want to carefully balance both of these things. Now, a brain overlord doesn't mean that you can't ever use this pilot again, because 13 Sentinels doesn't have any permadeath mechanics. You can just press a button to recover their health at the cost of resetting your score multiplier. So if you're not pressed about these rewards, then don't feel too pressured to keep this streak up. Thirteen Sentinels Aegis Rim is a wonderful game, a grand achievement of visual novel storytelling. It's the culmination of all of Vanillaware's efforts thus far, and it shows in every facet. It's crazy that they took 12 Sentinels to get to this point. Oh 
<laughs> that wasn't funny. Fuck it, I'm throwing the script away, for the most part at least. Just gonna talk a little bit off the cuff about this game. 13 Sentinels is one of my favorite games of all time, right up there with 999 in the visual novel department, but definitely in my top 10, like, all-time favorites. In making this very lengthy and wordy video about the game and its systems, I hope I've at least succeeded in my elevator pitch idea. I know I definitely got very wordy in the RTS section about everything that goes on in this game, and I think both of the game's sections kind of highlight the game's best aspects, which is getting its hooks into you and then refusing to let go once it's got you. And I think that's what's so special about 13 Sentinels. It's a game that doesn't know when to let up, and when you play it, it does feel like it just flies by because you spend so much time just sitting there and experiencing it. So if you like visual novels in any capacity, I really recommend playing 13 Sentinels. A lot of the cooler stuff I can't really sit down and talk about because that's something that I want you to experience as you play it. So trust me on this one, I personally think it is very much worth the time investment that you put into it. And at the time of this recording, the Switch port is already out, and has been for a little while now. So if you would like to take this game out on the go, I really recommend getting it. There does seem to be some accessibility tweaks in the Switch version for handheld mode, but the story itself and everything around it is basically the same. So it really just depends on what you're looking for, uh, whether it's a portable experience, maybe one that you can play in bed, or something that you can just sit down and play after work like me. But anyway, in any capacity, I hope you check out 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. It's, again, one of my all-time favorites, and I definitely don't regret picking this game up. But that's gonna do it for today's look at 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. If you've made it this far, I humbly thank you again for your time and patience today. Today's Himawari variant was done by Belle at Gardenia Mist. She's modeled after Yuki Takamiya, my favorite from this game if you couldn't tell. I especially love the attention to detail with the rendering and the ribbon keeping her hair together. Thank you for your hard work, Belle. Her socials are up top and in the description. If you're interested in seeing what I do, go ahead and sub, ding the bell, and all that jazz. You guys showing your support is the main thing that motivates me to keep doing this. Are you interested in Aegis Rim? Did I do my job with this video? Have you played it and want to spread the love? Feel free to comment about it below. As always though, remember to stay gold and take care of yourselves. I'll see you next time.